Some very good news today. There are only wildfires on two continents today, and the yearly report on Earth's watershed was published, with analysts saying there's 2% more ice on the ice caps than a year ago. From drone samples, there are also only 2,746 plastic parts per million in 16 ounces of water. And we have news that two mammal populations are nearing stability after the gas catastrophe five years ago. I am also very happy to report the minister's plan to mine water from the passing asteroid was a success, bringing our water supply up to 92% capacity, which could sustain us for another eight generations with a 3% population growth. Which is very good news for those who want to be parents on the wait list. The minister released later. We interrupt this scheduled broadcast for a breaking news update from the Sticky Buttons podcast. Yo, what is up, you guys? This is Brandon, your host here at the Sticky Buttons podcast. And this is Blake. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Just hello. <laughs> And we're coming at you with a really special episode here. I'm really excited about this one, Blake. Um, Dude, I'm pretty excited too. Yeah, we've been working on this one for a while now. And we're going to be talking about a audiobook today. Do you want to tell us what the title is, Blake? Yeah, definitely. And just really quick, I'll give a plug out to it. It is a book. We both listen to it in the audio form. I don't know. Probably podcasters, we have a, the audio really resonates with us, you know, <laughs> but you can read it if you want to read it. So this book is called Blood, Sweat and Pixels, and it is by the noted games journalist Jason Schreier. And it is about the video game industry. And we both decided that we really needed to learn some more about it after we had a we had an episode that was kind of a little bit, a little bit sad. We had to do a take two on it just because we were frustrated about we had learned some things about the industry and we we're kind of frustrated and we decided we were going to educate ourselves a little bit more on it and we are here to provide a resource for you to educate yourself as well and to hopefully make it a little bit more digestible and i guess if you don't really want to pick up this book you can listen to us talk about it and kind of like the main themes and yeah. then if you also are like oh, i wasn't going to check it out and then you're interested in what we said definitely check it out yeah, folks, make sure make sure you stay tuned on this episode. This one's going to be a really interesting one. We're going to talk about a lot of different games and how they were developed and just some overarching themes in, in the book that really stood out to us. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're a video game podcast about the games that we love. And incidentally enough, I haven't played any of these games. <laughs> Really? Not one? No, not even Uncharted one. 4? I haven't played any of these, man. But that's insane. to say the least, it was it was so fascinating. And I'm sure that it absolutely, like, these are applied to. Or the themes seen in these chapters are just applied to just about any game. Which actually, you know, really quick, just to, to shout this out. In the introduction, the author, Jason Trier, is kind of talking about how he interviewed over a hundred game developers and executives from around the industry and his book. He primarily interviewed people from 2015 to 2017. And he kind of like one of the things that he really like hits home in the beginning, you know, like in the introduction of the book is how he was listening to a game developer talking about the horror stories of his game development. And he was like, wow, it seems like a, a miracle this game was made. And the like game developer stops him. And he's like, through this introduction, he's like quoting, actually quoting this person. And he's like, it's a miracle that any games are made. So I just think that's really interesting. Like, I mean, obviously we're going to get into it a little bit more, but just like listening to this, it really gives me the appreciation of, wow, like there are so many like people that listen to this. And I think in like one of our last episodes, I had just beaten Tomb Raider, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. And I was just amazed by the thousands of people that were in the credits of it. And like I said, like each person's name is only on the screen for like five, 10 seconds. And it was like 30 minutes of, of the credits. So that was like just having this context and like now playing video games, like it just totally changes my mindset of game development. Yeah. There's just so many units and, you know, intricate little parts of it and, it's really fascinating. And I first started to realize 
it's just how much went into video games when in super smash bros when you would finish the like pretty much the story you would fly through like the credits with the a ship from Star Fox, mm-hmm. and you would pretty much be like shooting the the credits and like gathering points for that. And oh, really? I didn't it, even know that was a thing. It's really long, and it just shows you like basically how many people were part of this body of work, and it, it really is fascinating. And then you know, getting this perspective of just how like different people who actually you know have these lived experiences. It just it gives you like a different kind of understanding of it all that I'm really appreciative for. Yeah, it's it's definitely it has definitely changed my view completely. And I guess we'll just jump right into it on, on that note, man. I mean, that was beautifully spoken. Thank you, Brandon. <laughs> so I think kind of the way that we're gonna do this is we're kind of each gonna briefly talk over or each each of us is gonna give a brief synopsis of five chapters. It's a ten chapter book. And honestly, the audio book is only like eight hours. Like it's so digestible. And I listen to it while working out on my bike or running and, or just like chilling. And like, it was, it was great. I really enjoyed it. But yeah, so anyways, each of us, were kind of each going to give like a brief synopsis of five chapters of the book. I'm going to do the first five chapters. Brandon's going to do the second five. And then we're just going to kind of feed off of that. So that's kind of the general structure that we're going to have for this. So the first chapter also worth noting that each chapter is a different game and each chapter he or the author edition Shire breaks down the development and history of that game. So the first one is pillars of eternity, which Brandon, would you mind looking up when this game was released while I briefly talk about it? Gotcha. So in this chapter, the, the studio that made pillars of eternity is kind of like on the, the brink of, of bankruptcy after like some failed projects. And so actually it's Obsidian, the, <laughs> which is a, a pretty well-known um, game studio. So if you ever heard of Obsidian, they're the ones who created Pillars of Eternity. And I think that they they had some, I don't, I don't really remember exactly the circumstances, but basically they had like two games that were like pulled from them or cut and Oh, I remember now. I so sorry. <laughs> it's a lot of book. Basically, they were fun. They they were they had two projects going on, and one was the South Park game. Do you know which one I'm talking about? The Stick of Truth. The Stick of Such Truth. Such a fun game. <laughs> Such a fun game. So they were working through uh, the development of that game, and also another game from Microsoft. And Microsoft like completely pulled the plug on them. And they were like, hey, like, sorry, like, we're canceling this game. Like, like you can't put like, so like when that happens, the game studio, like, they have, like, they can't publish it. And they like, essentially can't work on it because they don't own the IP. So Microsoft owned the IP. And they were on the brink of bankruptcy. And they were trying to figure out how they were going to fund it as an independent studio or like what they were even going to do. And it's kind of like the story of how they, they go about that. But basically they crowdfund a game and like through Kickstarter and they're able to develop the game that is Pillars of Eternity. And I think it's it's kind of funny because they also put in like stretch goals, which is like if they hit a certain threshold, they'll add this and, and this. And it was really cool because they kind of talked about how they added things and in retrospect, they shouldn't have added like, I think like a second city in the game. They were like, well, the first city was so meaningful. Like how, how did we make the second city meaningful? Yeah. And like those kind of things. And and it was really cool. Um, And I think a kind of really cool takeaway on this one is that I guess kind of at the end of it, I mean, like obviously they have like a hellish production and, they all have to crunch and it's like terrible and there's like not enough money and like a bunch of people get laid off when Microsoft cuts their funding before they decide to crowdfund and it's like terrible, but then they like they're crowdfunding or at the time that this book was released, they were crowdfunding their second game because they were like, we liked having the players be our investors and they're like, we liked ha- like being able to send out like one of the perks you can get, I think pretty like it's a pretty common theme when you kickstart a game 
one of the first tiers is like you get access to the beta and the the feedback from the beta is directly from the fans and i think that that's really positive because they don't like it's like people that want the game to be good they're giving feedback and it's like kind of a community-based kind of thing which so it has like even though it has like a terrible (laughs) beginning it has like a positive ending yeah so I mean, have you have you ever played Pillars of Eternity? Do you have any thoughts on the first chapter? I have never played Pillars of Eternity. It does look familiar, as in, like, I've seen it around the marketplace. It's been marketed to me a lot. It never quite caught my eye. That chapter was really interesting. That part about the, you know, really having that intricate city, they put all that work into it, and then... You know, they they struggled with kind of following that up. And that kind of, I felt like that really resonated with me and like basically a lot of like my work at school and, and kind of just with professors like following up my good work. I have a tendency of like turning in really good work in the beginning of the semester and then kind of like not being as consistent with it. And, and yeah, that part just like really resonated with me there. And just seeing that like other people also kind of run into that issue as well yeah definitely and that's you know that's an awesome takeaway because I, I didn't get that takeaway at all so it's awesome that you did <laughs> but yeah. yeah I thought it, I thought it was cool I mean obviously I thought the crowdfunding was kind of cool because I mean obviously I this was one of the first one first games to be crowdfunded and if you followed that at all crowdfunding doesn't really work I mean like it can work and there are a couple other games that are crowdfunded on here, but mm-hmm. there are, we're at a point now in 2021 where there have been a lot of people that have made Kickstarters about something, and then like it just like completely fell through, yeah, or like it unfortunately was just a, a fake. And I think I I think I gave like five dollars to a Kickstarter a couple of years ago, and yeah, that, I'm never getting those five dollars back. And I, <laughs> I mean, not it's that I really that want, them, but. Yeah, it's like had I had I been like a bigger backer of like that, like or if that product had like been like something that I really wanted, I mean, obviously I'd be let down because you remember at all what it was. Oh yeah, I totally do, and it's totally stupid through today's lens. And there's obviously reasons why it wouldn't have come out, but like with Kickstarter, like you don't like let's say like you like you and me were gonna start a game brand and we make a Kickstarter and then like we go bankrupt, like those people on Kickstarter don't get their money back. So there's like crowdfunding is just like, there's inherent risk to crowdfunding Mm -hmm. um, now. And I mean, that kind of sucks that so many people have been burned, but the thing that I bought on Kickstarter that I paid pledged $5 to was a quote unquote pocket laptop. And it was supposed to be, have all the computing powder power of a modern laptop in the size of a phone. And it like right. flipped open and everything like it was supposed to be like basically like less than the size of an iPad and like it's supposed to have like a phone screen and then like a tiny keyboard. And I was like, oh, that's like so cool. But of course, that's stupid <laughs> because we all have phones and stuff. <laughs> that sucks that that didn't become a reality for you, man. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm actually like, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> It's really okay that I will never have a pocket laptop that's approximately seven inches long. <laughs> there are some laptops that come surprisingly close though. But what's the point? I mean, we have, I mean, I have the iPhone Pro or iPhone 12 Pro Max, Brandon. So I think that the, I think that, that the iPhone that I have is probably about the size of the, the laptop screen that was advertised. I'm just looking at it now and thinking, yeah, I think that would, that's, that was about what it was. But anyways, <laughs> also another thing about crowdfunding and Kickstarter that I found out recently that is heartbreaking. After you, you can only once you start it, it has like a certain time frame. Like you can only, I guess, crowdfund for money for a certain time frame, and yeah. once that time frame's up, like it's over. And I, I am so sad that I discovered a a Kickstarter for a game that I'm like so interested in. And I like joined their discord and everything. I literally found it one day late, like a single day late. And I couldn't, I can't back it. So that I'm really sad about that. Anyways, I guess that's, that's chapter one. <laughs> Wasn't meant to be. 
wasn't meant to be. I am excited for when that game comes out, and I'm really excited to talk about it. And I guess I guess I'll just plug it. If you if you want to check it out, I think it's called Sky Climber. They, it looks absolutely so cool. It's by a New York company too, Sky Climbers. I'm excited. You can check it out on Steam. It's a multiplayer city building action RPG. That sounds really fun. Yeah, it looks so cool. Their their pledge goal was twenty five thousand dollars, and they raised three hundred and forty thousand. And they're New York, New York based. So check it out. I mean, unfortunately, you can't buy it or anything like that. But it looks so cool, and I'm I'm really excited to check it out. But back back to the back to the uh, blood, sweat, and pixels. Chapter two is Uncharted four, which was I thought was crazy. This this whole thing. So obviously Uncharted Four is by Naughty Dog, and man, I just thought I just thought this was crazy. Like the the story that this like game goes through is just one of the one of the craziest ones. And also just like right off the bat, like they they talk about crunch at the beginning of this, and they're like crunch is just something that happens at Naughty Dog. Like we don't even like we don't even address it. Like, like not that they don't address it, but they're like, we just accept it. Like we're the best in the business and like, we just, we just always crunch. And they just, that's just like what they say in, in the book about it. Like they're like quotes about it, which I mean, maybe that's good. Maybe, I mean, obviously I think that's, that's a little bit bad. I mean, I think that work life balance is really important, but that, yeah, that's kind of scary just to hear some of those stories. One of the guys, I think, says that he gained like 15 pounds over the course of the crunch. And another person like, literally had to get another apartment because he is like, I'm like my danger to myself and others driving home at 2 a.m. and then driving back at 5. And he's like, which like, that's insane. That's nuts. Yeah, there's no point in leaving. Yeah, no, thank you. So he ended up like getting a second apartment, like two blocks from from their office, which that sounds hellish to me. <laughs> like, no, thank you. <laughs> but basically for Uncharted 4, it was the story of two people. I mean, well, I guess really it's the story that there was somebody that, I don't remember her name, unfortunately, but she was a, a writer and director of Uncharted 4. And she she did not comment on this book because when she left, they... I guess from like what she has or what Jason, the, this reporter has been able to gather is that both Sony and which um, Naughty Dog is a Sony studio, both Sony and this person, they signed like agreements where they wouldn't talk bad about each other. So it was kind of like an amicable split and they don't really say anything about it, but basically things weren't going well for Uncharted 4 and she, they end up parting ways or the, the lead of the project ends up parting ways with the, the studio and the, the two people that made The Last of Us Part 1, or I guess it's just The Last of Us, the original The, the Last of Us, they had just finished that and they were like, because that was such a success, they were like going to take like a three to six month break and like work normal hours and like prototypes and stuff for their second game and just kind of like think about where they wanted to take that. But they were kind of like, Hey, like you guys are the leadership now. Like, like you guys just had the most successful game in our history. Like we kind of need you to save uncharted four, which also, I guess to know that those people were the ones that I guess like originally brought up about uncharted success. And it was really, it was really cool. They, they kind of talked about like, the crunch of the people and then the crunch of the directors and how they like completely rewrote the story, which I mean, is a common theme in this book is how many times the story is just completely rewritten at like the last minute. And then they also talk about how they were, they had to get this game delayed. And yeah, I thought that was really cool. Just like hear about the process and how like especially like early on because like when they talk about the delay they're like oh like sony is like that's fine like you can delay it but then it's a very common theme in the rest of the book that games don't like they're like 
people tell them, no, you can't delay this. And I just think that's interesting because he like even addresses it in the, in the second chapter, which I just think is crazy. But I guess, do you have anything that you want to say about this? Uncharted 4, I remember briefly playing. Really, really fun game. I definitely feel like I want to try it again and see see what it's like. It really seems so interesting. Naughty Dog, also a studio that I've seen in a lot of other titles that I've played. Um, and it's just such a cool name, Naughty Dog, and it makes sense that they would crunch because it's a dog and a dog crunches on bones. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. I think that they're actually like behind some like really cool games. Like I think Naughty Dog's behind yeah. like the Jack and Dexter games. Yeah, they here. I'm gonna actually gonna Google it because they're they're behind so much stuff right now. Yeah, yeah. Crash Bandicoot, Jack and Dexter. Just a lot of really well known titles. The Last of Us. Oh come on, they're behind The Last of Us. Yeah. I think That's, that yeah, I think that they're the yeah the the two people that they mainline or the two directors that were the directors of The Last of Us. Yeah, I guess I guess one takeaway that I have is that the I guess it's a quote. I'm actually going to quote something that one of the developers said, and they were like kind of like coming close to the end of the development. They said, "Perfect is the enemy of good." And they talked about all the bugs that they had and they were like, we just have to like fix bugs and just get it out. And they're like, perfect is the enemy of good. And I thought that was kind of interesting. I guess another thing, another thing that really stuck with me on this one was they said art is never finished. It's just abandoned. And that was kind of how they felt towards the end of the game. And they were like, we just got to like put an end to it for better or for worse. Yeah. I thought that that that's rough. (laughs) That's rough. That kind of, that just kind of made me feel a little somber just now. Yeah. Cause it's just so true. It's like, if you choose to look at it like that. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, that is, I feel like, yeah, that's definitely is like, you have to choose to look at it that way. But like, man, I just, I mean, like, it just feels like a very like sad take on, on art, which I mean, like, it can definitely bring so many people happiness, but then I guess like if you never abandon it, it becomes obsessive and it becomes something else entirely. So, but that was very cool. I guess we'll just move right on. Chapter three was Stardew Valley, which honestly I'm, I'm hardly going to talk about this one. And this is going to be my plug for this book. This, this chapter, like I, I got so emotional and like, it was just such a, a roller coaster ride. Like, If you like only like if if, I mean, honestly, like you do you if you want to get a PDF of this book right after listening to this and only read this chapter, like absolutely do that. Like this, (laughs) (laughs) this chapter just like blew me away. It is honestly. okay. so I guess I'll just talk about it a little bit. It is the the charming and heartwarming story of how Stardew Valley was made. And it is like seriously one of the most human stories about the human who made Stardew Valley. And I have never played this game and it is like, it is so on my list now. And I just am like really excited to check it out. It was by far my favorite chapter. And I like, don't want to spoil like any of it all. I don't want to overhype it. Just go read it or go listen to it yourself. Cause it was, it was just really cool. I think that like that on its own, just like if you like video games, like you'll like this. Cause it, it was one dude. One dude made Stardew Valley. It was all one guy. It's all one guy. And wow. I just think it's crazy. Yeah. It's it's so like powerful to see, uplifting to see what like humans are capable of. Yeah. And it's also like it's also a very like heartwarming story about video games. Like it ends on like a crazy positive note and it is like so optimistic and it's like I mean, like, it's just all, it just feels like all the things that video game, like, it feels like all the good of video games. I mean, like, I guess, like, not to, like, say too much about it, but, like, he does, it, like, talks about how he took, like, five years to make, and that's just, just absolutely crazy. And it's, it's funny, because, I mean, I guess, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll say this one more thing. It's really it's really cool because it talks about the artist's journey throughout the story as well. So how he feels about it, what goes on. Because I guess that Jason Trier was really able to get a lot of, I mean, obviously he was able to get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time about him. Um, but it's also like he's the only person that made this. So that was really cool. And it also has like a lot of interviews of his girlfriend at the time, who was like one of the only people that he talked to about it at all, which is cool. Yeah. So go listen to this book, go read this book. Like if you were like not sold on it, like maybe just this one chapter. And after that, like, see if it's like, this is like for you, but definitely if you like video games, like this is, this is a good story. Moving on to Diablo three, which man, I just got to say, before we talk about this, I have always been like so fascinated with Diablo. Like it's one of those things where it's like, I've always wanted to get into and I just never have like for like whatever reason. I've always wanted to like get into Diablo, like Diablo 2 just looks so cool. Like after hearing about Diablo 3, I was like, that just seems fun. But I don't like love like the arts. I mean, not that I don't like love the art style. I just like, I don't know. Like I just like demons aren't really my vibe, but <laughs> yeah, but like it seems like a really cool concept. Have you ever played any of the Diablo games at all? I've never played any of the Diablos. I have seen them like marketed towards me they a lot of really these are fun. pretty pretty triple a um, they seem really yeah they seem really fun the art style is yeah i agree with you it's kind of intense yeah. it's i i think it's really cool though honestly and and i i'm with you we got it gotta give it a try yeah it feels like kind of goth but like it's really no like you know what i mean like it feels like the arts, the art style would be goth, but then it just feels like it's not really goth, which is nothing wrong with goth. It's just not really my vibe, but I'm really fascinated by this game. and I really want to check it out anyways. So Diablo three was the, the sequel and follow up to Diablo two. And in it, they kind of like very briefly talk about how this was like 10 years. Like they hadn't like, Diablo 3 was 10 years after Diablo 2 and Diablo 2 was like a smashing success and like you have 10 years to build a fan base like 10 years for people to like get hype about a sequel like I can only imagine what that would be like and it's crazy because the the team the basically the in the first like bit of this chapter they release the game and then come to find out that they they don't have the server capacity to support the people that are playing it so it's an online only game which was like i mean yeah i think it's online only i think you can do things all, like like the store you don't have to necessarily be playing with other players but it is like you have to be connected to the internet to actually play the game for whatever reason they decided to go that way and they just didn't have the server capacity and there was an air 37 and if, like anybody that tried to play it got air 37 like it was unplayable because so many people were trying to play it like nobody could play it because of air 37 and basically it's just i guess like the the story of them getting it online so everybody could play which took like weeks and then <laughs> people hated it <laughs> for better i'm actually like they just hated it like they're as because, they should I mean, like there was filled with microtransactions and it was absolutely not what the players wanted. And they had like, like very big design flaws. And this book really kind of details like in, in very sp specifics, what was not good about it, why it wasn't good. Like the design elements, the elements of like reward and how like the players were rewarded for playing. And there's like the risk reward for playing versus like time played and how there was like <clears throat> literally a mode on the game. I think it was, I think they said it was called like hell mode or something, but in order to have hell mode, you had to have in order to play hell mode, you had to have legendary items, but you couldn't, the only place you could get legendary items was in hell mode. So they basically essentially had like the hardest mode with like the best loot you couldn't even play. And they like, I don't even know how that's possible. <laughs> and a lot of the time, like, you know, like a game like was shipped and out. And then they also talk about how the the loot system was terrible. 
And if you got a legendary item, odds were that it wouldn't even be for your class and it would be useless for you, which I mean, I guess you could just sell it then. <laughs> I mean, because I think that they, they did have like an auction house. So I guess people were able to sell their stuff and get the in-game currencies. And it was really interesting to see like how they had all these ideas and then they just like really didn't pan out. And some of the, I mean, obviously some of them were kind of predatory and then it's kind of the redemption story, like obviously like explaining all of that and then also what they did to fix it and also like the people that fixed it and how like one person and his team was really able to, to like they started doing something completely different or the guy started doing something completely different for Diablo three and then ended up like rising through the ranks and stepping up and really changing like the whole thing. And two years after um, the launch of this game, they released, released this thing called the Reaper of Souls patch. And it basically completely fixed and reworked all the games that the, that people had with launch and they like pretty much cut the, auction actually i think they completely cut the auction house and it was really cool because like it also like kind of touches on like the fans and uh, community base and how like it was able to come like full circle from like how and how the team was able to use like fan feedback in order to influence the game and really make it what fans wanted and it was really cool oh i think you're muted yeah, I really enjoyed this chapter as well. Diablo 3 was, I believe, a AAA title. Definitely was a AAA title. And just to find out that that was like a thing that, that happened, I feel like that's kind of like history in a sense that like a game came out at first and it was so predatory. And then they were able to like kind of work work that back. I don't know. It feels like it should be in a museum somewhere in an exhibit like this happened. Yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, this, I mean, that's kind of one of the, you know, the, I guess the benefits of like having journalism. So like you can see these stories and like, I mean, honestly, this is from like 2015. Like I'm, I'm like, this is just really cool that like this story is out there and like, you really need to hear it. And I'm sure that hearing this would like aid you and how you think about games today and maybe what actions you could take to like how you could actually like make the community better, you know, like there's, like, right. um, I think that they, they may have mentioned like fan surveys, you know, or, I mean, like also like they said the game developers like looked on Reddit and stuff like that, which is really cool. And like, they even shout out like this, like type of player, I guess like there was like a type of player that there was, they were calling themselves a quote unquote ironborn and, I guess it was like people like it was like a I guess kind of like a social norm of people playing it. like if you and if you were like in the community, you would know about this. And it was like how you could play the game without the the in-game store. And that was really cool that they like I mean, and obviously they end up cutting the store. So like that like is no was no longer a thing. But they were like the the fans were like petitioning to like make them like have them add that as like a class that you could play as which I think was really cool. Also something that you said, you kind of like talked about the predatoriness of it. Also like predatory in, in the hours, like of hours of people played, which, um, you know, obviously like if you have like, I mean, games can be addictive and like for better or for worse, like you do spend a lot of time with them, but like this one, like, just think of like, like grinding for like hundreds of hours, you know, for something and, and then having it like not pay off and like how frustrating that can be and like the predatory and like obviously money, but like also like time spent, I thought was interesting too. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I'm, that's what I'm saying. Like people are going to remember that for a long time, the people involved in that whole situation, yeah. um, I'm sure it left a lasting impact in their lives and definitely changed their perspectives on, on games. And I'm curious to see, I wish I would have tried it so I could, you know, we can try it now and have the benefits of time and all that feedback and patches. You know, I mean, that is that is the good side of, of playing something after it comes out. Like, for example, like, I guess to bring this into into the the today, there's this new game called that came out called Returnal for PlayStation 5, which I 
shouted out earlier on the show when it like they originally had the trailers for it. I was like, I like I at the time I said my goal was to get a PlayStation 5 at the time that game came out. Shocker. I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> but that game, they they've already had like a dozen some patches. It's only been out for like a week or two. And they've just been like constantly updating it and there's people are having a lot of problems with it, but they're like, they're, they can, people can like see the potential and they're like, Oh, like if all of these things are tweaked um, and actually, you know, funny enough, the, the person, Jason Schreier, who, who wrote this book, he has a podcast called triple click. And I, I listened to it and actually, I think they may have actually like released this on the day that we're recording, which is May 13th, 2021. He talks about how he, he viewed that game should have been an early access and it's just funny to see how like this is like a common thing like this happens all the time like yeah you know this this happened in 2017 it's happening or 2015 or whenever it came out and it's happening now and you know 2021 and it you know it's really crazy this whole book just talks about the pressures that people have of getting the games out and like honestly like we haven't really touched on it at all but like i mean like a little bit in uncharted 4 but like Literally the entire story of Uncharted 4 was changed one year before the game was out. And they like cut so much of it. And I just think that's yeah. crazy. There's a that's... couple other. Yeah, it's crazy, dude, how much they like cut and change these things. And like, I think that that's, that's definitely interesting because like when a game has a good story, like you definitely know it. And like when you have a game that has a story that doesn't feel cohesive, like you feel it. Like for example, the the Shadow of the Tomb Raider by Square Enix that you know I just gave a review of on like the past episode, this like last episode. The story was really not that cohesive, but like the gameplay was like so fun, you know. And like I can just see like this exact thing happening in the production of that game, where they were like, "Oh, what's the story? I don't even know." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it like indicative of of just how like elusive the the video game industry can be like trying to like when you release something just having something that really works something that people really remember and want to play is so hard to find and and that's why people feel the need of like okay we need to change the story because we don't think this is something that people are going to want to play and it, it just really sucks that there's so much art that's like abandoned and that's something that i remember in that chapter they went over like all these cities and like layouts and like all this work that they put into the story that they just had to leave you know and pick up a new ship yeah it's it's honestly crazy and also just like another thing before you kind of move on i i actually like just in in talking about this past game i had forgotten the, this book is really good about introducing i think that the the way that he has structured the stories is to introduce you to different game design like lingo and like in the first one he talks about crunch and funding and publishing and in the second chapter so the, the second chapter about uncharted 4 he talks about this thing called a gray box which a gray box is basically like the level without any of the art attached to it. And that's how they're able to like prototype levels and stuff. And in Sardew Valley, I think he talks about the art of it and the rendering and in Diablo, they talk about patches and updates and that's like really cool how they do that throughout the book. And that is definitely also like something that, that I learned a ton about. Like I have never really, I mean, like I've seen a gray box and now, now that I've seen it, I know what, like what it's called and they also like, I mean, this is also in the introduction, but he talks about how there's really no standardized practices throughout the industry, why that is and why there are so many problems with this industry, which he talks about in the introduction, which very cool, very interesting, very insightful. I really want to pass the floor on to you, Brandon, but I do have one more chapter to go over <laughs> and then it's all yours, my friend. The next chapter was Halo Wars which this is honestly really interesting. This chapter is about the game Halo Wars and it's really it's it's really cool because and so Bungie is the studio that creates Halo. They actually Brandon is going to talk about a chapter 
where Bungie is the primary studio, which is Destiny. But at this point in time, for Halo Wars, Bungie is owned by Microsoft. And the studio that creates Halo Wars is Ensemble. And they are the studio that's best known for Age of Empires. And Age of Empires is a real-time strategy game, which of course is what Halo is, real-time strategy. So that's kind of like the Civ games and like all those kind of games. And after, so it kind of talks about the history of that and Microsoft and how Microsoft, the studio, or the company Microsoft bought Ensemble after Age of Empires and they had their sequels were sequentially profitable. And they said that, hey, you can kind of make the game that you want now. Like, And they were prototyping. And also like, it's really cool because they had a really cool, they talk about the company structure of Ensemble, which I don't know if you remember any of this, Brandon, but they kind of talked about how everybody kind of like worked on whatever they wanted to do. And it was like very like the, like the structure. Was, yeah, yeah, it was very free form. It was, it was very interesting to hear about that. And then also like, this this story does not have a positive ending. <laughs> I guess spoilers for chapter five, the studio ends up completely falling apart, <laughs> which is oh, which is crazy. But yeah, I just think it's kind of interesting. Like it kind of talks about like people talk about the good and the bads of that and like their corporate structure, which was really, really fascinating to me personally. Anyways, so basically they were creating this sci-fi real-time strategy game instead of like in Age of Empires or yeah, the Age of Empire games, which takes you through different civilizations. Um, this one kind of was just like in one in one spot and you were like, it was sci-fi. So the progression was different and it was really cool. And like the story seemed really fun. And then basically they pitched it to Microsoft and they were like, this is what we've been working on. This is the game. And they were like, oh, cool. Well, it turns out we don't, really want this intellectual property. We think it's going to be too hard of a sell to make a new IP. You're going to make a Halo. And they were like, what? And they were like, we like that. Like, you don't understand. Like if we make it another IP, like it will completely change everything. Like we won't be able to use like any of the art. We won't be able to like, and they're like, we don't care. You're going to make a Halo (laughs) because that's a really hot IP right now. And you'll be able to turn this out before Halo 3 comes out, right? And they were like, owned by Microsoft. They were like, I guess so, if we still want jobs. <laughs> um, <sighs> and basically, like, it talks about how, like, this person that had, like, a really cushy job at this company, he was like, yeah, like, I was, like, creating the story for this, this IP. And then they were just like, nope, like, sorry, dude, like, you can't do it. And then, like, it also, like, is crazy because Bungie is owned by Microsoft, who is the people that created Halo. They, it was funny because, I mean, it kind of, it's like in the, in the chapter, it's kind of structured in a funny way because they talk about how the, these people basically have a meeting with Bungie and they, they're like, all right, like we're doing this. Like we're making a a game under your IP that you all created and they had no warning. And they were like, oh, like we thought you had been told about this by Microsoft and Microsoft was like, no, you were telling them the bad news. (laughs) <laughs> kind of thing. I just, it's, it's really funny that dynamic of like a Microsoft owning these, both these studios, which I guess spoilers. I mean, it's not really spoilers because it's the context of history. Neither of these studios are owned by Microsoft anymore, which is kind of funny, but basically it's just crazy. Like the development of this and them having to work with Bungie and then like the drama between the two studios that are like owned by Microsoft and like the whole halo thing. Like it's yeah. crazy. I, it was a, I mean, just, I never played Halo Wars. I actually have the Halo Wars disc for the 360, um, <laughs> but I've never played it. And yeah, it's just, it's just a really crazy story about how it's created and the trials and tribulations of that. And also using another studio's IP. And this is also, they talk about how, because they had to rework like so much of their assets because the game was put they were they were forced to change their ip they had to rework all these game assets and they had to basically program a trailer for ea because they were owned by microsoft and microsoft had like said that like you're going to present this at ea 
and they like didn't have a trailer ready. So they had to like program a trailer to make it look like the game was working. And they were like, basically we programmed everything that happened inside the trailer. And a lot of the things ended up getting cut, which I think is interesting. But yeah, do you have any, any thoughts on that? It was a, a good chapter. I really enjoyed it, especially given that I played Halo Wars very briefly. It was just one of those games I like kind of tried. I was kind of in the same boat as Microsoft where I was like kind of looking forward to Halo 3 coming out. Oh, that's their whole strategy, man. They got your 60 bucks. Yep. But um, I still got a chance to try it and I was I was glad I did. I was glad I got this perspective as well. Who knew Microsoft could be such a bully? <laughs> but it makes sense when you have such a large <clears throat> share of the market. You know, you can you can afford to be like that. So Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because I mean just think of where think of where both these franchises could be if if this hadn't happened. I mean basically the drama of this ended up creating the the downfall and like an internal breakdown of, of the studio, which was very very interesting. But all right, man. The floor is all yours. Chapter six. What are we looking at? So for chapter six, we were looking at Dragon Age Inquisition. And this is a title that came out back in 2014. A title I am uh, also familiar playing. I spent a lot of time on the Xbox as a, as a teenager. So I got to play a lot of these titles. And you none tell of them- me a little bit about this game, actually? Because it actually sounded fascinating to me. Is this kind of um, like, like a Skyrim kind of thing? Or is this like more like a Dragon Quest? Like, what is this? Uh, it's like a mixture of both, I would say. It's it's an RPG. So you kind of, you just start off, you pick a role, and you kind of just develop your character. You play through a story. It was it was pretty fun. I didn't finish it, though. It, it didn't really, like, captivate me, though. I was st- still on the Skyrim wave at that time because they were both out at the same time and yeah i didn't give the the game the time that it deserved but it was still a really good title but as far as like blood sweat and pixels goes it was made in under 16 months which was something that really surprised me oh i don't remember that that's crazy something like an rpg to be made in 16 months is that's impressive and i think it speaks to like the legwork or or not more so just the productivity at EA. It was developed at EA. And well, it's actually, I think it's developed by BioWare, who is owned by EA. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And EA, BioWare was using this game engine called Frostbite. And do you remember anything about Frostbite on that chapter? Yeah, yeah. That was really cool. Almost like the whole chapter is about the kind of like, well, no, there's a huge part of the chapter that's about like the struggle of them wanting to use frostbite because it would allow them to make the game more beautiful. But had the frostbite engine had never really been used for a game like this. So they had to do like a lot of legwork to create all the things to make yeah. it happen, like to make the tools for that game to actually work. And it was kind of funny like looking at it through this lens because the Bioware was like, this is like a short-term loss, long-term game gain for EA Studios because they were like in the Frostbite engine, like everybody, like all of EA Studios are going to develop or like gain from us doing R&D on this because then they're all going to be able to use this and like go off of our work after like making the tools. So I thought that was interesting that they were kind of like, hey, make this game. Also, use this engine that you don't know how to use and also make this tools for all of our other studios. <laughs> yeah. Which like, I they guess makes of, sense, but they were kind of like Guinea pigs for the, for the whole engine there. And like, you know, they Schreier quoted like a, a former employee who said like, it's really hard to develop a game when you're fighting against your tool set all the time. And, you know, just imagining that, like trying to put myself in those shoes, that sounds really rough. And especially the timeline that they were on, you know, given that it was developed at such a fast pace. Yeah, it was just, I can't imagine what that was like to be part of that body of work. But nonetheless, they still, you know, they still pushed through it. 
they dropped a pretty good game. I think they did a pretty good job of Dragon Age Inquisition. You can still play it. It's still up in the market. So I I would yeah. check it out. I would check it out again and just to refresh my memory on it. I also think that it's interesting, like kind of like on the, the game design, game development aspect of this. Obviously, they talk about the Frostbite engine. But in this one in particular, this chapter, they also talk about bugs, which I thought was crazy because they talk about how like they use QA testers to find bugs. And then they also said that like a Bioware, they have quantitative and qualitative bugs. So like yeah. they're like, if, for example, somebody says this game's not fun in this 15 minutes, they would consider that a bug. And yeah. I think the the developer was quoted as saying this is this had the most bugs of any game I had ever seen by like tenfold. And, and like I think they they had the total, like he's like, I can tell you how many bugs were in it. And it was over ninety nine thousand. Wow! Like they like he literally like quoted like he's like yes this is actually how many bugs we had and it was like ninety nine thousand something something, which is just like crazy. That's insane. Which is just nuts. And they also like I think it's like really funny because um, they also like obviously like this is like an educational book and they talk about like bugs and they're like hey like what is a bug and they're like if you are walking down a pathway and like your sword clips through the wall like yes that's technically a bug but they're never going to fix that because they have <laughs> nine, like this game had 99,000 bugs like, it was absolutely crazy but it's funny because they also like they they shout out that like if you have discovered a bug chances are we know about it but we didn't have time to fix it mm-hmm. which I was just like wow that's crazy and that really kind of brings it back to like the art is never finished. It's just abandoned. And I feel kind of bad. <laughs> like I feel terrible for the people that have to make these because I just feel like they have like bad working conditions. And totally. it's, so. it's a rough environment, which brings us to our, our next, our next title. Let's move on to shovel night. Before we move on chapter right. seven. So shovel night 2014 has a 10 out of 10 on steam which I think is worthy of, of recognizing Steam is so accessible to so many people. And for a game to get a 10 out of 10 on Steam is really impressive. But I digress. For Dragon Age, it was dealing with its horrific game engine. But for Shovel Knight, the mistake was over-promising features on Kickstarter, which, you know, back to the crowdfunding, which I feel like was kind of like an overarching, you know, theme in the book you know crowdfunding video games is kind of new way of like getting a game to come out Mm -hmm. it's a new a new avenue besides just a traditional kind of like big game publisher and it it seemed questionable whether a small team like yacht club was able to secure over three hundred thousand dollars without stretch goals like you know a four-player battle mode, a mission-based challenge mode, and other campaigns in the game. But still, Yacht Club pulled it off, and Shovel Knight received critical acclaim. It won various awards and is considered one of the best games in the year. So, you know, they they came in clutch, even though they overpromised. And they were still able to make people happy. And I thought it was a good game, Shovel Knight. Also, another title I've tried briefly. Really, really fun title. So many people at the time. It was like one of those things that's like becomes really popular and a lot of people want to try it. And I remember, was Twitch out at the time? I feel like this was a game. Yeah, was- yeah. I think that they, yeah, they also talk about a little bit in regards to Twitch, how they they went to like a an event and like some of the advice that they had gotten from other people that had crowdfunded video games was like, get it to Twitch streamers ASAP so that they will be able to promote it and play it. And that's one of the things they were like, we don't really know if we want to like have people play our demo, but they, they did it and that generated a ton of revenue for them. And it also like got people like really excited about it. And like, yeah, like kind of like the overarching theme with the crowdfunding, like it's, it's complicated and there are a lot of complicated stories about crowdfunding you know, but it like, I mean, 
It's crazy. This story was honestly also like, this is an indie developer, like not a triple A. And it's really cool because they all work for a studio that like, which this is also, this is like kind of cool. They also talk about this end of the video game industry. The company that they, that all these people worked for, like is a company that is like, if let's say you're developing a game and you need to outsource a level because you just can't finish it, that you hire these people. And they're like, yeah, like we just did whatever, like we were told to do, like we were worked on contracts from other big publishers. Like, like we did this, we went from this to that, to this. And that's how they were able to like learn how to do all these things. And like, that's crazy. Like, yeah, that's, that's really cool. It's like going from a place where you have no creative control and you just like crunch and to get things done to going from a place where, well, I mean, like, it's crazy. They talk about their crunch here and how they like weren't getting paid anymore. And like, whew, like it's, it's really like, I think, yeah, like definitely check this one out too, because it's, it's crazy. Kind of like the story of, of it. And also like how, like, I guess like expendable, it seems that people are in this industry. Like this yeah. guy, like one at the beginning of the chapters, one of the guys was like, yeah, I'm eventually going to leave like this company to help you guys out with this, but I'm going to stay here for like a bit. And just like, like, while you guys get it started, I'm just going to continue to work here so I can can continue to collect paychecks. He's like, I'll still work with you guys on the weekends, but I still need the money. And then they found out that he was like planning on leaving. And then they like pulled him into a meeting and they're like, are you planning on leaving? And he was like, eventually. And they like, he like didn't give him a timeline and they were just like, well, you can make today your last day. Like, fuck that. (laughs) That's terrible. Like, I'm so glad that they found success because like, that is awful. They like literally like they risked it for the biscuit. They like risked everything on this this venture. And like, I mean, this is like kind of like the opposite of not having like an image or or, like a direct um, like vision going into it. Like they, they were like, we made like, they had like found this vision and then they were like, we have to make this because it's so good. And that's what drove them through all of it as opposed to like the other ones where it's like, we got to ship a game. Like we don't really know what we're doing. Like right. this is, this is like the opposite, the cosmic opposite of that, where they're like underfunded and <laughs> it's just crazy. And it's also crazy because this game came out in 2014. And I think that this, this book came out like post 2017. And he kind of like says at the end of this chapter that like, they're still working on like three years later, like they're still working on, the stretch goals that they promised on their original Kickstarter. And and they were like, and like, he's like, yeah, we get requests from people that backed us, that paid us. And they're like, Hey, like we would love for you to make another game and to not work on these stretch goals. Like it's fine. Like you need, like we want to see something else from your team, not like a continuation of this game, but they were like, we promised it. And we feel like we have to do it. Like we're a new company. Like we need to build that trust. And like, and they were like, also like you guys helped us make this happen. So like, we're going to like, follow through which is really yeah. cool but also like crazy that, that that's a really like that's a cool story too i would say shovel knight i mean obviously like i love indie indie stories but i love that that was cool i mean that's really all i have to say listen to that chapter too that chapter is really good yeah the shovel knight chapter you you might really enjoy that one on top of stardew valley but moving on to chapter eight destiny a title that was released in 2017 at the time it was kind of like a bungie was owned by activision but then they separated in 2019 no they were owned um, by they were owned by microsoft activision activision was the one that they signed with to publish destiny but bungie was owned by microsoft and then they bought them bought their independence from microsoft okay let me see Sorry, then, I just like just re-listened to that chapter, so that one that was fresh. <laughs> Bungie please. Okay. And then so for years, Bungie craved independence from Microsoft until they got it and they realized they were in over their heads when they had to make this title Destiny a reality. Mm-hmm. And do you remember seeing the trailer for Destiny? Yeah, I remember I remember like this is like prime, like they were trying to hype this game up. Like and yeah. it's it's funny because like later on in the chapter, they talk about how 
Activision had made like such a huge investment in it. They were like, this can't flop like this. <laughs> so they like, and I think there's also like some drama in this as well to like, on like one of their first trailers, there's like some drama about that. And I'll let you talk about that too, or maybe we'll talk about it later, but <laughs> yeah, the definitely the marketing definitely hit me on this one. And it honestly, it looked, it looked so cool. Like the game looked amazing. Yeah, I could say the same thing. It was so captivating. I remember all my friends at the time, like Call of Duty was definitely the title that was like being played. I think it might have been Black Ops 1 at the time. No, this is 2017. So like 2016, probably like Black Ops 2. But yeah, just just to see that Bungie was coming with like something different than Halo was really exciting. And I remember just really looking forward to getting my hands on the title. And yeah, Destiny, as they called it, was to be a cross between a traditional shooter like Halo and a massive multiplayer like WoW or Warcraft. And by the way, have you ever played WoW? No, I haven't, man. I've always kind of wanted to get into it, but I've never really, I never really got into it. No, I mean, not that I didn't want to. I I played it for a little bit. It was... I actually, I remember asking... Not that you didn't want to. Yeah, yeah. I remember sitting down and asking my parents if I could play it. And, and then they were like, like, this isn't going to run on our computer one. And then like, I had no idea. It was like a subscription based thing. And I was like, yeah, kind of feels like a scam. That's what I said. And my parents were like, yeah, it does. It does feel like a scam. You shouldn't play this. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a fun game. I mean, it really captivated so many people and, and left the lasting impact on the lives of many. And, and I feel like it influenced so many other titles, titles that like I've played in my, in my life. But moving on, it was, you know, they, they really wanted this game to become sort of like a, a cultural touchstone. And, but a, a year before, they're supposed to like fully release it. Basically, a year before their their release date, the senior staff was unhappy with the storyline, which took a really long time to develop. I I think it was a couple of years, which again yeah. is like is like that idea of like having to abandon the art. You know, you have such a like well written, enveloped story. You have all this lore, all this art, and you just you know, you got to drop it for something that's a little more marketable, something that's a little more digestible. And that's just the nature of, of the industry. Yeah, it was crazy because this is also like another game development thing that they that they brought into this chapter. They talked about how I don't really remember exactly what it's called, but basically it was like the, the story team. They would produce this video and it would basically tell everybody what the story was going to be, because like, I mean, I guess at the time, so this is, they also talk about this a little bit. They were like, the original Halo is made by eight people. And at this point, like we're a studio of hundreds and hundreds of people. And they kind of shout out there, like there was not a cohesive vision. It was really hard to communicate across all those lines. And like, there were a lot of people that were developing the game that didn't know what the story was. And whatever the story video is called, basically the video that has like the story script, they like put that out there and then everyone was like this is garbage like this is like not cohesive like this isn't this isn't right like it doesn't feel good like it's not like the work just isn't being done and then like the lead person on the story was like hey like that's the whole point of this like the whole point of this is to like say like hey like the story's not perfect like how do we communicate the story into the gameplay and the story into the game and then they the people were like no like just scrap all of it and then they did that and they fired that guy and which he was like, well, actually they didn't fire him. I, I remember this because I think they, I think he was, I think they quoted him for the books. So like they interviewed him. He said that he, they had asked him to stay and help them redo the story. And he was like, I fundamentally don't think you can make a new story at this stage of development and have the game be good. I'm so against you on that. And if you want to go forward with making a new story, like I quit and they, he quit and they, they made a new story and there's also like a quote from somebody on the writer's team. It like, they don't actually quote this person because like, obviously like anonymity. And they said like the whole writing staff was shunned and he's like, yeah, basically they're the upper management gone to a room, made the story 
and they didn't let any of the writers help. And then the writers had to, had to fix it after that. So like, I guess it was like, I mean, like the story was basically made by a committee and it's funny because like, I think that Jason like quotes a, like a review that's like, it's like the story was made by a committee and we're just kind of, we're just kind of fitting. It was right on. It was right on. And it's really crazy. They, they have like quotes from the voice actors in this, like, it's really a crazy story about how this just like didn't, like they really bit off more than they could chew. Yeah. And it was just like, it's crazy, which I mean, obviously through the context of time, destiny two has completely changed the video game industry and being it like changed what it means to be a video game and a, a video game and live service. Like they've completely changed what that means. And, and that's really, honestly, really, really cool what they've gone on to do. But this, it was just, it's really crazy that this story did not have a positive ending. <laughs> and it is, they also talk about how like a lot of the people in game development that actually make the games, their their pay is based on bonus or like they count on bonuses to have pays like for part of their pay. And basically they were like, their bonuses were dependent upon Metacritic scores, which is like, that's bullshit because <laughs> like that sucks. And basically they didn't reach their Metacritic goal. so. I think it was, they reached like, what, like a 70? Yeah, I think it was like 70 something. And I think their goal was like, or their bonuses was like 85. So they had to get above 85, which I think also like somewhere else, in some other chapter, I don't remember which one, they talk about how the people that were going to get bonuses, if the Metacritic score was 80, 85, which I guess that's a common benchmark, but the Metacritic score ended up being 84 and they didn't get their bonuses. I'm like, that sucks so much, especially because Metacritic is like not even good. It's not even like real. Oh, it's really not. That's so like that. I feel so bad for those people. Like that is such an injustice. But anyways, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, man. Yeah. And, and you know, I played it. I played Destiny and I remember really enjoying it a lot. I'm um, having a good time with just like the exploration and the multiplayer aspects it looks of it. really cool it looks like something that i would be all over like a sci-fi shooter like sign me up man i don't know why i've never i don't know why i've never hopped on board with this i think it's it was probably just, the price tag i feel like yeah the, the price tag and just like i feel like it's one of those titles where i mean it is multiplayer based so you really need a, a party of people to like really get the full experience out of it and I feel like that's that was the thing with Destiny is like Bungie had a hard time getting people on it synchronously. You know, people bought it like at different times and then they played it and kind of like lost its hype. I feel like if more people bought it all at once, it would have really had been like good all at once. Yeah. And I think like with Destiny 2, I think one of the things that they do for Destiny 2 is I think that they they basically have like, instead of like having a season, they have kind of like a, like they'll release like a DLC that's like 10 bucks. And then that has like a bunch of stuff that you can do. Yeah. Um, so it's like new areas and new stuff instead of like just new objectives in the same areas. So they really kind of changed the game in destiny two, which I'm, I'd love to hear about the development of destiny two through the lens of that success after hearing this story. Yeah. Like this is crazy. Also, like, I don't know if you mentioned this, Brandon, but this is the team that, like, brought us Halo. Like, that's cr- – I mean, I'm sure we mentioned that. That's crazy. Like, the, the studio that made Halo is able to buy their independence from Microsoft. And, they, I mean, obviously, the sequel to Destiny is, like, amazing and really, like, really cool. But just to hear this story, like, wow. I was just blown away, man. And, like, just by all the things. Great game. They did a great job and. Just some really talented people, man. I, I learned about a whole different avenue or just like facet of, of people that exist through this book. But yeah, on, on to the next title, The Witcher, The Witcher 3, which came out in 2015. It caught everyone by surprise when a lesser known Polish studio with a track record of just two games unveiled Witcher 3. It was a massive open world role playing game. And, you know, while an average role playing game requires about 25 hours to complete, 
The Witcher 3 took a staggering 200 hours. They really outdid themselves with this. That's one. like if you do it fast. Yeah. And so, like, if you really take your time, like Blake does, you're going to be in there. <laughs> you're going to be in there for a while. But the map in the sequel is also 20 times larger than its predecessor with great attention to detail and from a player point of view there can never be too much detail that was something that in this chapter they really kind of you know zoomed in on is like the idea of how much they could go into a detail and like we would take it for granted and that's that's something that like i really i really took a moment it really resonated with me because it's so true like you can get so lost in the details and like to other people you can just glance over it and miss it and that happens to me so often i feel like i'm i'm not so detail oriented and i'd like to be more detail oriented i feel like there's beauty in the details yeah i think that one of the things they talk about in this is really just like how they made all the stories and like just the complexities of like what how the stories could could i guess vary and like how they're like we don't want any like story to be the same like we don't i think they like like straight up call a fetch quest they're like we don't like fetch quests like we don't want that to be in here and i mean obviously like i i mean i have never played witcher 3 have you played the witcher 3 briefly yeah i think that they like i mean this is like regarded as one of the like best open world games ever because of just how long like it takes to play and and like just the complexity of the storylines and the side quest which is really cool. One of the things about this studio I really thought, or well, this this chapter was really interesting is I guess hearing about the publishing of non-US studios. I thought that was really cool because it's like a Polish studio. Obviously also through the context of history, this is CD Projekt Red. These are the people that put out Cyberpunk. So Cyberpunk was their follow-up to this. And I mean, I've, I've definitely like heard people talk about the Witcher 3 as like the best video game of all time. Like people do, people do think that I'm looking up like what they're like, not that it matters too much, but like what their rating is. Yeah. 93 on Metacritic, 10 out of 10 on Steam or 4.8 out of five. Like, I mean, this is, I mean, yeah, like this is like a, like <laughs> it's a, this is the best 10 out of 10 adult game. Like no child should play it which I guess that goes without saying, but <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, this is supposed to be one of the best games of all time. So it's crazy. It's crazy to see that and hear about this. I mean, I personally, I think I was just trying to get through the book at this point. I don't really remember too much of, of this chapter, but it was really cool to hear about how they started too. Cause I think that the studio that developed this game, they started just by getting the license of like normal like games that were popular in the US and publishing them in Polish or in Poland and and not not Polish obviously well actually i think they they do talk about that too the translation of how he would get a game like translate it and publish it and that's how they were able to make their money and they also talk about how in Poland which I think at the time was maybe a Soviet, maybe like when this guy was growing up, like I guess the CEO of CD Projekt Red or like maybe a head developer, like one of the main guys, they were were talking about his story and he was like, when I was growing up, I'm pretty sure that this was part, like wherever he lived was part of like the SSR maybe, or maybe, maybe I'm getting that completely wrong, but basically, or maybe they didn't have like good copyright laws for media and he was like, yeah, basically everything I, I played, I got from the flea market and I paid like 10, like, like whatever, like 10 cents for it. And I was just able to like, like for like the cost of getting like a sandwich, I could like get it from a guy that ripped the game from the internet, which like, and he talks about like how like in Poland, like that's pretty common, which I mean, that just hearing about that was interesting. Like how people play video games in other parts of the world is interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating to see like just the different perspectives people have of form of entertainment that we we love so much. And I guess also something else on this that I do remember now that I'm thinking about it. I guess the story of The Witcher, it's like a it's like a book series and of like a Polish writer. He like wrote these stories as like books. 
And they were and like by the time that this company C D project rad was like, we want to make a video game instead of just licensing out video games, they were like, we should do a title that's like representative of Poland. And they like got the license or like they bought the rights to make the books like or they like I guess they bought the license from the guy that wrote the books to make the games about it. And they were able to do that at like a very reasonable price, he said, because the person had no intention of going into video games and and that's just so cool. Like I just think that like this whole thing is like because it's like a, it's like a non US story, like it's a European story and like that literature in a video game that's like very common. Like I'm probably not gonna go and read The Witcher, but I would go and play The Witcher. The Witcher Three, you know. So like if I, I if I'm like for whatever reason I'm like I want to experience that kind of a like story like from Eastern Europe and I want to experience an Eastern European story and how see how that differs from a U.S. based story. Like here it is right here. Like this is this is what you can do. And this was very like is like kind of exploratory chapter for me where I was like oh wow like that's interesting like that's that's cool like. The other ones, it's kind of like, oh, wow, this is like a crazy story about how this thing they got made. But this one was really like, I was like, wow. Like, I was really left by this chapter, like, just like, I guess a state of wonder at it a little bit. Yeah, and, and it really speaks to Schreier's ability as a as a journalist. You know, he's, he's a multinational journalist. He's able to, like, you know, connect with people in many different places and just to be able to tell the story I think is really impressive and, and he did a really, a really good job in making it a part of blood, sweat and pixels. Yeah, definitely. This is the last one. This is chapter 10. <laughs> chapter 10, Star Wars 1313, which can you guess what year that came out in Blake? Well, it never came out, but when it, I think it was supposed <laughs> to come out in 2013. <laughs> Yeah, spoilers for chapter 10 this game never came out <laughs> it was a lucky lucky number year 2013 13 <laughs> so all nine stories in nine chapters left the reader happy lucas arts has gone through some ups and downs but the real crumble begins after a massive four billion acquisition deal by disney following disney's lackluster interest in video games LucasArts found its key people leaving one after another. And to make matters worse, they couldn't replace, let alone onboard new hires, because Disney froze the hiring line. So, you know, pretty soon the majority of the staff working on this title were laid off alongside the closure of the LucasArts video game unit. So years of work and thousands of hours of labor were scrapped and it seems most likely that they will never see the light of day again yeah this is this is a crazy story i don't know if you remember do you actually remember this like when this game was supposed to come out i don't i i like didn't really get into the star wars franchise like that man well as the as the resident star wars like crazy fan nerd here let me just tell you this is a heartbreaking story about a game that never came out and it it's just it's crazy basically it didn't come out because disney bought the star wars franchise from george lucas and this game was just one of the things the projects that they were working on that just got cut and oh it, it's it's really sad because it was like so close to being done like i think that they said that they were like i have never seen a game that was as close to being like this close to production that was just like like cut and like it's really cool because it was supposed to be a game where you're a bounty hunter. Like it was supposed to be like obviously like and like what's crazy is like this totally could have capitalized on like all the like the hype. I mean, obviously the Mandalorian hadn't come out, but like there was definitely a market for that, obviously, because of the success of the Mandalorian and just like oh I'm feeling like it's hard for me to talk about this just because I'm like <laughs> it's just uh, I'm not like yeah. emotional about it. I don't know. It's just like Obviously, a lot of people, myself included, feel like the Star Wars franchise has just been completely mishandled. And it just feels like, especially on the gaming front, it's just not there. And like, yeah, 
and it's really tough because there's just like teases and like it's like you could have this in a video game and then you just don't like this game was supposed to come out like this was announced like people wanted this so bad like you're literally a bounty hunter working in Coruscant's underworld like throughout this game like an open world game for your bounty hunter in the Star Wars universe like sign me up that sounds so fucking lit and just cut man like because Disney well yeah it's crazy like like you said like LucasArts was bought by Disney and this this game like obviously like they had been having problems before but when they were bought by Disney they were just like business as usual and then like they froze the hiring line like continue to work on all projects but like we can't hire anybody else and the people just kind of start like leaving oh, it's just sad it's sad cuz like i think that at this time it was like a couple like it was within a year of its release date and it was basically ready like it was not ready but like it was pretty much ready and it's yeah. just sad that that it just wasn't wasn't seen through and you know also, what though? There's got to be somebody somewhere who has Star Wars 1313 in their library and can play it. I don't see. That's the thing, though. I don't think that. So I think that, like, obviously they talk about gray boxes. I think that this game was like mostly gray box and they hadn't put the art to it. So, like, yeah, I don't know. But like, even so, like, I don't. How many games do you play from thir- 2013? So. <laughs> What year did Skyrim come out? I still play that. Yeah, that's true, dude. I feel like I got I on the on the Skyrim note. I really want to hop back on Skyrim and play some of that, dude. Dude, that game is something else. It's a gift from God. <laughs> that's what that game is. What year did Skyrim come out? 2011. So I guess like I guess it's not reasonable, but man, I just like I'm just sad. I mean, it's just sad and disappointed, you know, about how star wars video games have been handled and also like i mean we we have like hinted on it so many times uh, that we're gonna like talk about this eventually but i guess we'll just talk about it briefly now like the 2015 battlefront loved it thought it was so fun and obviously like the battlefront 2 is like the huge one of the biggest scandals um video game scandals in modern history and i mean like i have definitely enjoyed my time with it and over this past week actually like actually, since I like heard about this, I was like, I really want to jump back in that game, and because I mean, like, even though the game has its flaws, like you can still run around as kill stormtroopers and still run around as a Jedi. Like it definitely has like so much to it, and obviously, like I've talked about it on the show, Jedi Fallen Order, probably my favorite video game of all time. So I just like, I mean, not the like, like obviously, like I lo- I love Star Wars, but like. I mean, like I'm, I'm critical of it too. Like I, I'm, I don't know. I just feel like I wish that this had come out and just like this story of this. It's wow. It's just crazy. It's crazy from like a business standpoint. It's also crazy that like it's sad that people like literally put thousands of hours into this and it was just scrapped. So that's kind of tough on that. Overall, this book has made me more grateful for all the video games that I have ever played just getting to understand like the amount of work that goes into it the amount of stress that the people have to go through just to make these things a reality yeah the overall themes is just like wow what a nightmare it must be to work on work on these and also like we shout it out like and he says it in the intro like it's like a miracle that any games get made and after reading this or after listening to this book it really feels like it really feels like any any game is, that has come out is a miracle. I mean, I guess like just moving forward, like having all this context is just, it's it's crazy. And I'm definitely going to like think of games dif- differently, like think of them critically differently. This was definitely like an eye-opening experience for me. And just like seeing like, like all sides of it, it's just really crazy. And I mean, I really hope that you check this book out. Yeah, I mean, just check this book out. Like if you like video games at all. Like this, you're going to learn so much. It feels like we, I mean, like through the context of we're getting close to and end, end, ending up our recording session here, it feels like we talked about these things for a lot, a lot of time, but we hardly touched the surface. And it is, it is like written so beautifully by Jason Charlie. He really makes it like, 
it's just like each of these is a story and it has its ups and downs and its arcs and its peaks and valleys. And it's really, it's really fun just to hear about it. Unfortunately, I, I wish that I could say some more about the, the Star Wars and the Witcher, but I mean, I honestly don't remember those chapters as much to be honest, but yeah, man, just go check out this book and thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Do you have anything you want to say before we wrap it up, Brandon? Peace in the streets. I guess that's it. I guess, wow, I guess we're really cutting this out. Well, <laughs> I will say, well, I will say one more thing before we really, really end it up. If you're listening to this in New York City and you have a public library card, you can get this book for free in the audiobook version from the app Libby. It, it is available. Like if you have a, a New York City public library card, you just got to download the Libby app and you can find those links from the New York City Public Library website. And if you are not listening to this in New York City, your local library probably has an app where you can listen to audiobooks for free. If not, you can get digital ebooks for free from your library. I almost guarantee it. Check that out. You know, there's a lot of problems in America, but we do have a a somewhat functional public library system. So I mean, you are entitled to that if you like pay taxes in that area. So check that out. Like that's a public a public good and you can learn about some video games. Do you think libraries are ever going to have video games, Brandon? Hopefully someday they do. Yeah, that'd be cool. If a, if a library had a, like a video game collection, what would you pick first? Well, if I had to carry a video game collection for a library, I'd probably pick something like Minecraft. Uh. I was I was thinking that like imagine that the library has like that's a that's a good way to spin it. I was thinking like imagine a library has every single video game ever. Which would you rent for a week? Okay, I would probably rent Midnight Club. You should get that game, man. You've talked about it a couple of times. <laughs> I talk about it too much. It's a scary. Like I talk about it when I shouldn't even talk about it, and it's it's just a thing. It's a thing. I, that's funny. <laughs> then that game are connected. <laughs> Maybe you should just pull the trigger, man. I think it's only a couple of bucks on Amazon. <laughs> Dude, I just know if I get it, I won't stop playing it. <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing, man. Maybe you need some of that. <laughs> yeah. That's all I'm going to talk about in the pod. So last week on Midnight Club. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's crazy. I'd probably do some... <laughs> Very much the opposite, like Pokemon Fire Red or something like that, which I could play right now. Um, I don't know. (laughs) But anyways, I guess we'll wrap it up. Thanks so much for uh, listening to us talk for a long time about this book. But if you want to hear more about it and the stories about how these video games are created, please check out this book, Blood, Sweat and Pixels by Jason Schreier. And I guess that he also has a new book that came out this week, but that's not really, we're not, that's not about, this episode is not about that. So I guess check this guy out. He works for Bloomberg. I guess he's notable. Yeah. Check this book out, Blood, Sweat, and Pixels. I hope that you have a great week. Thank you so much for listening. And yeah, peace in the streets. Peace in the streets, y'all.